All right, Aspire Leaders and Teach Better Family, I am so excited for our conversation today because who I have is someone that's been on the podcast before and is the number two most listened to podcast on Aspire to Lead. So uh, I put that as a badge of honor because Evan, you are doing some phenomenal things around the world, honestly, with your company, Beluga, and uh, we'll touch on that. But also, you are very passionate about some topics that I love, which is personalized learning, the collaboration piece globally, not just within the United States. And then, of course, I want to do something fun with you, which is predicting some changes in education for 2024. We're in the midst of January, and I know a lot of people are are looking to potentially, you know, do some things a little bit different than they're used to. And I always love kind of picking your brain as far as you having this like net that's a little bit different than some folks just because you're working with so many different people around the world. So Evan Schwartz, thank you so much for being on Aspire to Lead. Yeah, my pleasure, Josh. Thanks for having me back. And I have to uh, figure out who that number one spot is. Now, right? <laughs> that person and figure out how to dethrone them. But, uh, you know, always good to be on here. Appreciate everything you guys are doing. And, you know, just uh, happy that people are listening to it as well. Oh, for sure. And you had some phenomenal insights. If anyone's listening right now on your podcast player or on YouTube, just make sure you're heading over and, and checking what Evan was talking about before, because, man, you were talking about just like uh, something we're going to talk about a little bit today, but just the video content that you guys produce and then also, you know, just how to incorporate that in the classroom. And I, I thought it was so powerful. So, um, yeah, let's talk about personalized learning first. Um but before you do that, I should I probably should pump the brakes and, and ask you to kind of share about your story because you know potentially some folks haven't heard that last episode. And so if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about your educational journey and and how you started this phenomenal company. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And I'll give you the, the high level spiel on this side in a sense. So um, I'm a startup corp entrepreneur through and through. I think I worked uh, corporate two weeks in my life. That's my claim to fame. Uh, <laughs> and ultimately just realized like out of college, you can imagine at the time parents. You just got out of college. What are you doing possibly? Um, but really just saw that there were a lot of opportunities in the world to change things. And I think that's the driving factor, right? That every one of us, especially as educators, why we get into the practice in general. So education has kind of always been my backbone, whether I realized it or not, in a sense. Yeah. And my early career was focused really on marketing and connecting to Gen Y, Gen Z and setting them up for success, both in and out of the classroom. And Beluga came about about at this point almost nine years ago, which is crazy to even think about, especially during those pandemic years where yeah. it seems like 50 at this point. Uh, but Beluga came about, honestly, just being tapped into the global education space from a nonprofit side and supporting different organizations and realizing like, hey, we are failing our kids left and right. And at the time, you know, I've, I've been fortunate throughout my life. I always say that is I've built a global network been able to understand different perspectives and travel and things along those lines. And it changes your opinion about everything. And at the time, nine years ago, reflecting on some conversations that I had, realizing like all these media headlines and all this clickbait content, and it's probably even worse today than it was back then. Yeah. Like we are feeding kids garbage, like literal garbage for their mind. And if we're not changing this in some way, shape or form, we're just failing them. And it starts in the classroom, yeah. right? So we looked around the world and started taking inspiration from the things we love the most. Right. So Netflix and Hulu and Disney and Instagram and Snap and all those great things. How do we bring that learning experience into the classroom? How do we make it social? So today, nine years later, I mean, the network, I cannot thank enough. Uh, Beluga is active now in about 120 countries, uh, primarily still North America is still our bread and butter for sure. But realizing what's taking place globally has definitely expanded our vision of what's needed in education, also what's coming. And what our core competency is, we work with different content creators worldwide, groups like UNICEF, uh, different movie studios, documentaries, et cetera, to bring that really rich video content the same way as I sit on my couch and watch Netflix into the classroom. Today, we work with upwards of about 500 global organizations, uh, tens of thousands of hours of content that's vetted by educators on our side. Everything is then curated. Everything is then aligned to subject area standards, curriculum, et cetera. So it could be used in the classroom on a day-to-day -day. and in giving students and teachers social tools similar to the Instagrams, the Snaps, the TikToks of the world in a safe, secure, vetted environment where they're able to create in multiple modalities. That's a huge aspect for us, right? Like let's give kids the tools that they're thriving with outside the classroom. So I don't understand why education doesn't value a podcast the same way they do a standardized test, right? Like 
more work goes into the podcast. I can promise you that than more soft skills, quote unquote. And I know we're on video. So I'm happy yeah. that people can see my face when I say that one. <laughs> um, but let's give them the tools that they're going to be thriving with way after their K-12 career. Yeah. And let's knock down the four walls of the classroom and give them the ability to share, learn, and collaborate globally. So Beluga does a lot from everyday lesson plan replacement and supplement to a lot of PBL, which I'm so excited about these days, um, to a lot of personalized learning as well for both students and teachers. So that's a you know, high level spiel in a nutshell for you. I love it. So let's talk about the personalized learning piece because I love your charge. I mean, obviously you created this company because you saw some deficiencies within the classroom and you talked about soft skills or maybe essential skills is what we need to say here. Um, and really focusing on like the personal side of the student. And so I want to know what that connection is and, and what you're doing with school districts to kind of help, you know, change the landscape of the classroom. Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing that we realized, and this has honestly come more so over the last two years, like the tail end, and I don't even know if it's the tail end, but the tail end of the pandemic in a sense mm -hmm. is teachers are hurting, right? Like they really are. It's yeah. not easy being a teacher today. I mean, like there's districts, we run a lot of promotions and like, you can't give away free lunch to teachers. They don't even have time to eat it. Yep. So how are we expecting them to learn new technologies and implement new pedagogies? It's impossible. So where our personalized learning actually has started is with teachers. And how do we come into this learning experience and understand you're a science teacher, right? You teach eighth grade students and three different languages are spoken in your classroom. 10 of those kids didn't have breakfast this morning. Two of those kids go home to a one parent household and they're all expected to get the same outcome. It's insanity, literally insanity. So what we really have started doing more than ever before in the last two years is really hand-holding school districts and trying to figure out, let's work backwards in a sense, right? I always ask this conversation. I have the luxury of speaking with principals and superintendents every single day and understanding what's taking place within their district, within their buildings, pluses, minuses, et cetera. Where I always bring the conversation is, if we're having this conversation in 12 months, what did we knock out the park, right? And how do we work backwards to get there? And where it starts is our mission is we want to change the world, right? Like we believe planting a seed in a learner, student, teacher, it doesn't matter. And giving them that knowledge can literally change the outlook and pathway of their career, life, et cetera, and chain reaction community and then globally, right? That's how we always look at education. It's the foundation. But if a teacher comes in and says, guys, like changing the world, crunchy, granola, kumbaya is awesome. Like sign me up for it. But I need a freaking math lesson for tomorrow morning, right? Like we got to work there, right? Like we need to be able to meet you. So we know the content can align in a lot of different ways, it checks the boxes on those curriculum areas and standards, which you could probably imagine how I feel about standards just from my tone, right? And I know all of us are in that boat, but it's, it is what it is right today. So if that's the case, then how do we give teachers the flexibility and freedom not to worry about the content, but getting back to really understanding the impact Beluga can make and understanding how they could shift back to what they signed up for really is to educate, guide, and inspire students. So with all that mouthful that I just gave you, where we've come in with personalization is a lot of curation, a lot of content alignment. And I mean, we get the other day, I'll give an example. We had one district that we worked really closely with, actually near Neck of the Woods, that came in and said like, listen, I'm working with GT and TAG students. And we want to personalize it for their classroom and their experience. So we know we could have content for students. That's the easy part, right? Like getting kids excited, but we need to be able to give that teacher the flexibility and the resources to even be able to have those conversations with not just the four kids that are identified as gifted and talented, but every single kid in their classroom could be gifted and talented, right? So like, how do we give them the tools to then bring their students to that point to say, I'm really interested in medicine, or I'm really interested in football, or cutting hair. And these are real examples that we got from these students, which is awesome, right? But I think it starts with what do teachers need today? Let's give them the tools where I don't care if it saves them 10 minutes, it's valuable, right? Ideally, we save them a whole lot more time than that. But once they're there and realize the impact, and what we've seen is that it's really easy to implement technology. So we're not going to sell you on we're the best new product and like our content is better than anyone's, which we do believe ultimately we have to. But at the end of the day, it's how do we just support teachers? And then going into the platform, how does that teacher then have the flexibility and time to then support their students? And the beauty of our technology, especially now, nine years later, is that everything is algorithm based and it's personalized. So if I come in and say, hey, I love frogs and pizza as a second grade learner, well, I'm getting served all that material, age appropriate, subject appropriate, 
And the neat part, what we've seen over the last eight, nine years is that that second grader is then in 10th and 11th grade and the system has grown with them, right? While the teacher is continuing to get those resources year over year. So we've been doing a lot of personalization, a lot of curation, not only for teachers, but schools as a whole and districts as well. So I think I wrote an article about this recently too. It's like, I think curation is one of the most underutilized terms in education. And when you realize the power of it, it I mean, it breaks down everything. So that's, um, you know, a lot of our personalization focuses on that. Yeah. I love that curation piece because it is important. I mean, everyone is different and has different interests and different pathways mm -hmm. to success within the educational system. And uh, just can say enough about what you're trying to accomplish again, not only in our country, but globally. And you had talked about the global connection and I want to kind of dive into that a little bit more because I know obviously the buzzword is collaboration, right? Collaborating with those yeah. in your building and your district and, and potentially in your state, but you also have this the idea of collaboration beyond our country. And I would love to hear kind of, you know, your charge for that and, and how that's being implemented and for our folks to be able to get out to other countries, because what we're doing here isn't, always the best <laughs> we can learn from other folks yeah no doubt but we can learn big time from other folks yeah. right? i mean you look at how divided our country is and it's scary right now yeah, like, it is. what we're giving our kids to walk into um and i don't care what side politically you're on right i think we could all agree like our, we are failing our kids and yep. the next generation um from a collaboration side you know collaboration is a loaded term right and we've realized that especially i go back to my first point of you know, personalization, it's like, oh, well, here's all these resources, but I have 45 minutes and you want me to connect with someone in Australia around yeah. fishing? Like, what are you talking about? Right? <laughs> this is insanity. So the neat thing about collaboration is that it happens in every field, every industry, and in every aspect of our lives. Yeah. And one of the interesting things, and someone brought this to me years ago, it's like K-12 education, for the most part, traditionally, is one of the only ecosystems that we don't encourage every single day collaboration. I mean, I remember my own days in school a while back is like, there's folders up and you know, people are hiding their answers like this. Like, this is insane, guys, right? Like, let's actually have conversation around this. And again, testing is another conversation of ball of wax we get into, but kids should be working together 24 seven, right? Like there should never be that isolated period where, you know, it's drill and kill. Ultimately, of here's curriculum and figure it out yourself and hand in this assignment. There's no other industry on earth that does that, right? Like you and me, we always collaborate, we connect, we communicate. Education's great in that sense from a professional sense. If you go out of education, every industry fails ultimately if they don't connect and collaborate. So that skill, an essential skill, I love how you said that instead of soft skill, because soft skill even like gives me the heebie-jeebies. It's like, it's the opposite of what it should be. Um, essential skills, I'm going to start using that and quoting on it too, is collaboration, communication, presentation, reflection. I think you look at some of the big topics in education over the last few years, SEL, the core foundation of that is collaboration, right? It's how am I referring to myself and how am I relating to others? So collaboration to us means a lot of different things, right? Within our ecosystem in Beluga, what we've seen is that students are collaborating the second that bell rings to go home. So why are we not bringing this into the class? And I'll give a great example of like video games. Right? Our kids are talking, communicating, and playing and connecting. Where just read an article yesterday that play based learning is actually more impactful than instruction based learning, which I think there's something real to that. Um, oh, yeah. I hate taking away play, you know, from our kids too, but like they're going there, they're connecting with kids all over the world. And like it doesn't matter what religion they are, what race, what culture, identity, like all these big overwhelming factors within our society that get demonized right? This kid's just playing a game at the end of the day. And that's all they care about, right? Like mm -hmm. it's a beautiful thing. I know technology is a big, scary animal, right? Which it is, but it gets a bad rap sometimes and how our kids are actually able to enhance their 21st century learning skills and have that pathway. So collaboration to us is those key essential skills that set kids up for success. But in the core foundation of it, the beauty of Beluga is we never believe learning should happen within one classroom. And geographically, I just get paired randomly with 20 kids that their parents had the exact same idea, right? At one point in their lives as my parents. And here we are, right? 20 kids with completely different background that live in one location. How do we knock that concept out by saying every single kid can learn from one another? 
And it's not just globally. And that, that's one of the really big aspects that we've seen. I mean, we work with one district, I won't name them, but very, very divided. And very divided in a century old topic of race. I mean, so much so I was at the table with this district, it almost fly on the wall, right? They brought me in just to give some advice on it. And one of the teachers came to the table and said, and different race than other teachers at the table and said, I don't want to be told how to sit, talk or eat at the table. And you're going to listen to me. And it's like, okay, we're, we're going down here, right? Like we've seen this play out before and it was a hundred years ago, ultimately. So we need to get better at this. So collaboration, I encourage schools all over the world, collaborate with your neighbor first. Like how much can we learn, especially big districts, but small ones too, even with our classmates, we have no idea what people are going through every day. And just starting to ask those questions and find common ground. And that's really where our pedagogy and almost secret sauces with Beluga is we believe any topic can be educational. And if we're breaking down that topic, I mean, we have everything from, I don't know, poachers in Tanzania to the history of pizza to, you know, traditional chemistry stuff. But if we could just get around this real world, quote unquote, content and start sharing different opinions and ideas, and that's what students are creating within Beluga, let me give you my idea on, you know, what equality should look like today. Podcast, image, video, text, drawing, et cetera. And my peer could see it. We start breaking down those barriers. So collaboration happens, one, with those essential skills. It then branches out to a real collaboration, as we all know it, of let's share and communicate with others. But what teachers have the ability to do within the platform, and this is something we are leaning into heavily in 24 more than ever, is connecting with other teachers, whether that be just from a PBL or lens, whether that be from a PLN lens as well of, hey, let's build network, or globally. So we have teachers all around the world. I was on this morning with a teacher in Greece that was just talking with a teacher in South Africa all around the global goals, which we love. Right? Like, how do we focus on sustainability? And what they're doing is they're sharing ideas first around pedagogy. And Josh, I'll tell you, one of our big aspects within the platform is alignment. We probably have four to five million standards, right? Those traditional next gen, it's the common core. I'll throw them under the bus for a second. Don't hate me on it. But they're all the same, right? Like every single objective is the exact same for kids. It's just branded a different way, which is understandable. Yep. But everyone's doing very similar work here. Let's share ideas on best practice. And then where collaboration takes a whole nother level is those teachers bringing their students together uh, from around the world or locally even to share ideas. But one of the things that we've seen over the last two years since that tail end of the pandemic too is industry is joining the conversation. And it's opened us up to a boatload of CTE programs where we have the ability through our network. I mean, we're connected to thousands globally of professionals and organizations that want to help kids. Right. This isn't, you know, some sort of monetary benefit to them. It's like, no, instead of coming to a school for one hour with an astronaut and saying like, hey, we just did it. Now, what do we do with the rest of the year? Right. Like we were jazzed up about that. How do we give them that capability to continue communicating, connecting with these experts and educators and organizations? So we have a lot of requests that come in and we get them connected through our network. And we've been doing that constantly. 24 will make it a little bit even easier for teachers. Um, and school districts also bring in their own experts so that, you know, the local baker or the CEO or the fireman that comes in, how do they continue joining the conversation? And where all this inspiration has actually come from is student projects in Beluga. So it wasn't our idea. Students were bringing their own experts into the learning experience. And we were seeing just incredible learning outcomes and saying, like, this is unbelievable. We don't need that big title or big organization to make an impact. It's everyday people making everyday changes, right? So uh, probably more than you asked for on the collaboration side, <laughs> or foundation of what we do. Well, I mean, it's a huge topic. And like you said, I mean, that term is an umbrella for so many different aspects, especially in education and that it is lacking. There, There is improvement to be made. You were talking about just even like the local, you know, small district or even large district. I mean, there were plenty of times, you know, in the districts that I was in that were very large that I didn't know what was going on in the campus next to us, you know, and, and we were uh, just maybe a block away from each other. Right. And so like, if we're not even collaborating within our own little area, like how are we, how are we not expanding that even further? And so. And I'll, I'll, I'll go on that real quick. Yeah, start, please. But what we do is the kid gets out of 12th grade and goes to university or a job for the first time and sees completely different people than they were brought up with. 
yep. and has no idea how to relate to them, right? And this person was five minute drive north or south or east or west. Mm -hmm. And if we could start breaking down those barriers at a really young age, and I'm fascinated by that, right? Like, when do we become jaded, right, to yep. our community ultimately? And we all are in some way, shape, or form. But if we can introduce that to kids at a much earlier age, like, what could the outcome be? Right? And yep. that's a question that now, I, don't, I don't have an answer for, but I think that's something that, um, you know, gets us out of bed in the morning. Well, at least bring them to the table to have those conversations. I think that's the the first step. And you're right. I mean, you talk about being in a bubble. I mean, you only get exposed to so much and you're only experiencing with, within your, your small community. And there's so much more out there uh, that you can be exposed to. And I want to touch on what we've been deeming essential skills, because obviously when you look at that, or you could even use the term future ready skills, you know, for the job market, as far as what our students need to have moving forward to be successful in probably professions that don't even exist. Let's mm -hmm. be honest, you know, we're, we're only on the tip of the iceberg with uh, AI and that world, but I, I want to really pick your brain, buddy, <laughs> as far as, you know, yeah. you, you have exposure to so many folks globally and I want to, touch on like 2024, right? As far as moving into the new year, yeah. looking at predictions of change in education, what do you think maybe are like the top three things that will really be shifting? Because obviously the pandemic changed things, but we kind of went backwards after things started to get, you know, people getting back in the building and whatnot. You know, a lot of folks, I heard this so many times and it was really bothersome is like getting back to normal, right? And really what they meant was like getting back to the old traditional things were established and instead of going, you know, forward. And so I just want to know like what, what you think is going to happen maybe in this next year, as far as changes within the, the learning environment. Yeah. And this could be an entire show in itself. Yes, and it could. <laughs> I'll give you a kind of, you know, where, where we're thinking, right. Sure. And where I think the industry is going. So obviously AI is here, right. It is yeah. not going anywhere. Um, it's not just kids using it. Right. I actually saw a stat the other day that said 66% of educators, including university, are using it on a day-to-day -day basis where I think students are actually under 40%. Yep. So the fact that like, hey, students are cheating on their tests, nonsense, right? Like, let's throw that out the window. Um, I think AI has leveled the playing field in a sense yep. of, you know, what could this world look like? And AI isn't there to, you know, necessarily, in my opinion, to take your test for you. AI is your thought partner. And the beauty of it is it grows with you. It's pulling resources from so many different places. However, there's a lot of skills that you still need with AI, right? Like I'll, I'll give you an example, a new job. You mentioned jobs. We have no idea what they're going to come. A job that came up six months ago is AI prompter, right? $300,000 salary. It's pretty good, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, AI prompter. Tell me that a year ago, I would have yep. no idea what you're talking about. For sure. What we've seen though is how do I ingest information? How do I get a little bit creative here? And critical thinking, right? And you see where we're going with this whole ball of wax. So those are simple skills again. Is I need to be able to disseminate that information and I need to be able to utilize it in some way, shape, or form. So coming into AI, I think it is a great, great thought partner. I think it is the game changer, honestly, in personalized learning and we have a lot of things behind the scenes that'll come up in 24 on a beluga side with AI. Um, it's not going anywhere, right? It's it's only going to get faster. I was listening to um podcast the other day with the founder of GPT. And he said, if you look at where GPT is today compared to where it'll be in a few years, it's basically comparing it to the iPhone one and iPhone now, right? Like you're not going to see those everyday updates, even though GPT plus and four changed a lot of things. Um, it's every single industry is going to use this. Right. There's no doubt about it. So I'll throw another stat at you and I'm kind of all over the place with my thought, but I want to kind of piece this together for you in the audience is a stat that is really alarming. And within the US, Canada and the UK over the next three to five years, it's projected that 44 percent average will lose teachers. So almost half the workforce of educators will go away over the next three to five years. Now, we are at the all time low of teachers entering the profession as well. There's no magic wand for this one, right? So if you start really thinking about, and also why are we losing them? Because of the working conditions, right? Because yep. they didn't sign up to teach two classrooms that are now combined into one 
and get the exact same pay and get the less respect than ever before and just drill and kill with testing and grading. Like it's crazy for people to stand there. And I have a really special place in my heart for teachers. My mom was an educator for 35 plus years and just like, it is difficult these days. So if we're not bringing people into the building, we still need to set students up for success. And it's not going to be just student in front of a screen with a robot. And, you know, this person's going to teach me and train me because those essential skills will not translate. However, where I do think the change happens is teachers are not going to be the necessary source of end all information. And I think most, if you really ask them behind closed walls, that would be a dream for them. Right. If they go into an interview, of course, I want to know everything about social studies and the Civil War because that's my job. But there's no reason to do it anymore. Right? If I could just analyze and give students inspiration and guide them on this journey, well, AI is going to feed them more information than I could ever even fathom ultimately. Right. So I think you're looking at an AI world where teachers are the focal point and gets us back to that guide, right? Where I think education needs to go. Now, the outcome of it is we're seeing the writing on the wall already, right? So a lot of different schools and universities and colleges are not looking at standardized testing anymore. And this is something I've said on like a lot of different podcasts. So if anyone's out there that said, hey, I've heard Evan say this before, I believe it. Uh, but ultimately, there's, I think, about 2,500 to 3,000 colleges and universities in the US alone that don't care what you got on your SAT or ACT anymore. This is a billion dollar industry, right? This is not a small market. If that's going away, we know what education is. It's a copycat industry. More universities will follow. And it's going to have a trickle down effect to K to 12, right? What are we showing to our students and how are we setting them up for success for that next level? And even professionally, if they don't want to go to university, but if we're not grading them anymore, which, oh man, I cannot wait for that day. But if we're not saying, hey, your standardized test dictates everything that you've ever learned and know and who you are for the last 12 years, which is craziness. And here's this piece of paper that gets you through the door. And once you're through the door, no one ever again in your life will ask you about this. We need to show depth and journey. And that's what I really am excited about. And where I think the AI comes in, where I think that teacher got in inspiration and collaboration. So I always use the example of like, if we have a student that wants to be a director, right, or a, a producer and make amazing content, the SAT and ACT means nothing to them, right? And we shouldn't have to pigeonhole them. Forget about the stress that comes with that for them and their family. And it's so inequitable. It's unbelievable. It's disgusting. But on that side, how do we start bringing them down a journey where I say, hey, Josh, you want to be a filmmaker? No problem. You want to go to USC or NYU next year? Or maybe you just want to jump into you know, Disney right, and start working for them. Show me your journey. And if I'm able to showcase that from a K to 12 experience, not just, hey, in high school, I got an internship at Disney and it was really awesome, but show me where you got passionate about storytelling and how you learned how to communicate with people, and how you learned how to document that. And on your side, right, editing and producing, it's really hard skills to learn. And if I could see that from a K to 12 process, instead of just a score, right, that actually brings life and humanity to education, and I use that term loosely here, but like, I, I believe it, right? Like we're dehumanizing the learning experience. The job of a school is not to set kids up for success. Ultimately, we need butts and seats. That's how we get funded and we need to get them out the door, right? And that's, that's hard. But if we're able to showcase that journey from K to 12 on a student side, regardless if they pivot 50 times, it doesn't matter. I know along the lines of the skills they picked up, the assets they created the same ways, what they're doing on social. And I have a really good sense when they want to make that jump. And it doesn't have to be 18. It could be at any age. But like when they want to make that jump to profession or industry or university, I know exactly where they're coming from. And I could have such a better sense of who this person is and set them up for success. Now, I think the tricky part is not AI, not content, not people, right? The tricky part is how do we analyze and assess that? And that's to me is one of the big outlining questions that a lot of people aren't talking about because it's complicated. But I think AI is here from the content side. I think teachers leaving the building will give other teachers the ability to maybe loosen the grip a little because they're not going to have a choice on what their traditional classroom experience can be. AI and technology will guide their student through a content experience. Community will come into the mix on, hey, maybe a CEO can connect with a sixth grader and teach them about business instead of that teacher trying to figure it out. And now the next part is, what am I able to do with all that stuff, right? So you go into portfolios and resumes and transcripts. And I think like 
we're almost talking about what comes next in that process, like digital identity ultimately. And how does it translate to the physical world? So I think there's a lot that takes place there, but man, I'll tell you, education is in for a world of hurt over the next 12 months. And I am a very positive person, almost like glass pouring over. <laughs> but you look at some things like ESSER funding is dried up, right? And there's some programming. I work with some great superintendents that are having to make the tough choice of, do I see, save programming? Do I save bodies in the classroom? I'm like, at the end of the day, the ones that hurt are the kids the most. So I think, you know, the, um, especially in my industry, right? The ed tech and the companies that got major, major valuations and major funding, uh, the revenues are not going to match over the next 12, 24 months. And it's just going to be one of those industry problems that we need to work together. We need to figure out like how we providing best solutions and resources uh, to both students and teachers. But, you know, it's, uh, it's the educator mentality, right? Like we're going to get up, we're going to bang on that door and do the best we possibly can every single day until someone's listening. And if we reach one person, it's valuable. And that's, you know, that, that's what I appreciate about education. Yeah. Yeah. That funnel of, of, you know, resources and, or lack thereof, um, will be interesting on how things will change. Cause I think it's going to force a lot of folks hands as far as looking at the system as a whole. And yeah, we, we can't have so many people leave and then not have those be replaced. And so it, it'll be a very interesting 12 months, like you said, and, uh, yeah. hopefully we can, collaborate as, as an educational community and, and figure out what's going to be best, not only for our students, but also for those in the profession. Cause mm -hmm. a lot of people, like you said, are, are struggling right now. All right, Evan, let's, uh, let's turn the tide a little bit and talk about actionable steps because I always love kind of ending the conversation with things that, you know, our aspiring and, and current leaders can do yeah. to enhance their leadership journey. So, you know, we've, we've talked about a lot of important topics today and I don't know if you want to tie it into that or maybe have a, a completely different action step for them. But if they're to do something tomorrow or next week, you know, what would you advise them to do? Yeah, I would, I would leverage their intelligence. And I, I use that in a way of so much content is being produced these days and it has never been easier to get connected with people. And I, I mentor a lot of young companies, not only in the ed tech space, but globally. And one of the biggest things I always say is people want to hear your experience and they want to hear your failures. And they want to hear your successes and authentic voice reigns supreme. And you see that. You see it on Twitter. You see it on Instagram. You see it on LinkedIn, which I am super bullish on right now. I think LinkedIn is a place that more educators need to be, especially understanding and connecting what's taking place in industries that their students will go into, like AI, right? So they don't have to be afraid of it. But I think sharing perspectives, opinions, ideas, and then seeing the fruits of that and saying like, wow, I inspired someone or someone really learned something from me or I got connected with this person and I'm going to work with them for the next five years. Like, I think that is a major play. And you don't have to be a content creator and create videos and podcasts every day. But I think getting uncomfortable, right, and putting yourself out there in a sense of just communicating your thoughts. Um, I, I've seen amazing things happen with that, right? Like laws of attraction from a sense of more people are coming into you, more conversations and opportunities are happening. So a big takeaway is start sharing. Right? like start telling people about your journeys and your hardships. And if we're able to break that down and to tie a bow on this, you know, that's collaboration 101, right? So I think, um, you know, that goes into a lot of the DNA at Beluga. It goes into my methodology overall, but I think if more people are putting out their learning journeys and not just their successes, right? But like the entire process, the journey is where it's at. It's not the destination, right? So yeah. if we could start communicating more, connecting more, let's do it. Yeah. So powerful. Evan, I want folks to be able to connect with you on social media, but then also with Beluga, because like you've shared uh, such a powerful company and you have so much to offer as far as the personalized learning. And so how can they connect with you either via website or on social media? Yeah. So, I, I mean, everyone's open on Beluga. It's a hundred percent free platform to register for uh, Beluga.org, B-E-L-O-U-G-A. We spell it wrong like a tech company would uh, for <laughs> SEO purposes, but definitely check it out, sign up. And, you know, if we're able to help you and your students, that's what we're here for. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. It's at Evan Schwartz and on LinkedIn is my big new platform at 24 now really spending time on it and devoting resources to it. So shoot me a message, a DM. I'm not going to shy away from it. That's how I've been able to connect with so many great people. Um, but yeah, we're here. Um, we're here to help in any way we can. Yeah. So let's tie a bow on that. Like you said, uh, as far as collaboration, I hope everyone listening is connecting with Evan and reaching out. Uh, he is one that is very generous with his time and, and, you know, making those connections with a whole host of educators. And, uh, that's what I appreciate most about 
you and, and what you do as far as your work. Um, of course, joshsamper.com, you can go over there if you want to check out Beluga, uh, click on the links, connect with Evan. And then, of course, you know, for those who are, you know, taking us in on YouTube, of course, you know, subscribe to Joshua Stamper, the channel, or you can go over to the Teach Better team page as that community is growing so much. Evan, thank you so much again for your time. It's such an honor to have you back on the Aspire to Lead podcast for a second time. And I just appreciate all of your hard work and what you're doing with the changes that are occurring in education. I think you're at the forefront of all of this, you know, amazing transformation of the education system. And I, I just want to um, tell you how much it means uh, to an educator myself and to the educational community uh, for the work that you're doing. I appreciate that, Josh. And I'll tell you, we're coming for that number one spot on your show too. So <laughs> uh, let's boost those views. <laughs> appreciate it. Thanks, buddy.